I want to say happy Resurrection Day for anyone that might be watching live. This isn't your normal, what we call Easter message, because we believe in resurrection. Easter, of course, is it's a pagan holiday that, you know, we want to talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So anyway, I just wanted to tell you happy Resurrection Day. All of us were believing for this in our lives, aren't we? We really are. Okay. So I'm going to teach today, and it'll be Second Kings. Second Kings chapter 5. And I'm going to be reading out of the New Living Translation. I love teaching out of it because it's an easy to understand writing a book. It's, it speaks more as, of course, we're Americans, so it speaks a lot as American language or the way we think and talk. So it's, it's a lot easier for me to teach out of it. So, Father, I ask that what you're wanting to say, God, that we have ears to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying, that you go beyond my natural words. For each person is needing to hear this in different ways for our future, for now. Father, we need to hear your spirit, Father. Even people that are watching online long time later, God, that, that it will be something that strikes their spirit, God, that this will speak to each and every one of us, Father. We have need of knowing this. We have need of walking in these things. And we thank you, Father God, that our hearts are open, our ears are alert, and we will receive everything that you want to work in us, not only right now, Father, but in the days to come that this will lodge inside of our spirits. And we just thank you and we praise you for your word. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that makes your word alive, that we hear your voice at times and we see visions of what you want. And we just praise you for that, Father. Okay, 2 Kings chapter 5, I'm going to start in verse 1. The king of Aram, and that's really Syria today, so I'm going to change it to Syria so we kind of know where it's at. The king of Syria had great admiration for Naaman, the commander of his army, because he was honorable, and because through him the Lord had given Syria great victories. But though Naaman was a mighty warrior, he suffered from leprosy. And that's a skin disease, okay? At that time... The Syrian raiders had invaded the land of Israel, and among them, their captives, was a young girl who had been given to Naaman's wife as a maid. One day, the girl said to her mistress, If only my master would go to see the prophet in Samaria, he would heal him of his leprosy. So Naaman told the king what the young girl from Israel had said. Go and visit the prophet, the king of Syria told him. I will send a letter of introduction for you to take unto the king of Israel. So Naaman started out. He carried gifts, 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold. Wouldn't we love to have all this today? Woo-wee. And 10 sets of clothing. The letter to the king of Israel said, With this letter, I present my servant, Naaman. I want you to heal him of his leprosy. And I thought that's interesting because the girl said, go see the prophet. Well, you know, in a lot of countries, even today, the the emperor, he's considered God in their country, and they worship him as God. And I wondered if that's what this was when I want you to heal him of his leprosy when... This king was not anointed for healing, if you know what I mean. So I thought that was interesting how he sent that. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes in dismay and said, This man sends me a leper to heal? Am I God that I can give life and take it away? 
I can see that he's just trying to pick a fight with me because Syria and Israel, they were fighting off and on a lot through the years. So he thought he was just picking on him, okay? But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes in dismay, he sent this message to him. Why are you so upset? Send Naaman to me, and he will learn that there is a true prophet here in Israel. And when he said that, that lets me know there must have been a lot of false prophets. And in Syria, they must have had false prophets because that's what Elisha said. Send him here and he will learn that there's a true prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and he waited at the door of Elisha's house. But Elisha sent a messenger out to him with this message. Go and wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, in the Jordan River, and then your skin will be restored, and you will be healed of your leprosy. But Naaman became angry, and he stalked away. I thought he would certainly come out to meet me, he said. I expected him to wave his hand over the leprosy and to call on the name of the Lord, his God, and heal me. Aren't the rivers of Damascus, the Bana and the Farpar, better than any of the rivers of Israel? Why shouldn't I wash in them and be healed? So Naaman turned and went away in a rage. But his officers tried to reason with him and said, Sir, if the prophet had told you to do something very difficult, wouldn't you have done it? So you should certainly obey him when he says simply, go and wash and be cured. So Naaman went down to the Jordan River and dipped himself seven times as the man of God had instructed him. And his skin became as healthy as the skin of a young child, and he was healed. Then Naaman and his entire party went back to find the man of God. They stood before him, and Naaman said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. Thank you, God, for your word. I've never heard this part taught on before, but the title of my message is, Who is this slave girl? Who is this slave girl? First of all, she's a captive. She's from another country. And like I said, that country and Israel had been at war off and on through a long time, off and on, off and on. Okay, she's a captive. She's not a paid employee, but she's a captive servant like a slave. And usually, they're not treated very well, are they, in any country. Plus, she's a young female. So she's captive. She's young. She's a female. And she's basically a slave. She's a girl, it says. One version calls it a maid. She's a young maid. And in that time period, she would be considered the lowest of the low in Syria. So who is she? Who is this girl? She's the lowest of the low in that social class. She would have absolutely no voice, no voice at all in that culture, none. She wasn't considered important enough by the writer of Second Kings to even be told her name. That's how low she was. A nobody. A nobody. But this young girl, this captive, spoke bravely to her mistress. Think about it. Her mistress just happens to be the wife of the commander of Syria's army. That's how big she was. 
and that's how big Naaman was. Naaman was not some farmer or shopkeeper down the road. He was a commander. He was very important. He was in the king's army. I mean, when you think about it, here's this nobody, young female girl, young thing who's a slave, and she bravely spoke to the mistress. So she said, if only my master would go see Israel's prophet, he would heal him. Who is this girl? Who is she? I mean, come on. Who is she that she would have that kind of bravery and that kind of guts? I mean, a slave off with her head. What do they care? You see what I'm saying? Who is she? Okay. She must have heard God tell her that he wanted to heal Naaman. She must have listened on exactly what to say and when to say it to her mistress. This young captive girl told Naaman's wife what she heard from God. And the wife apparently recognized the anointing and the authority in this young girl's voice that she listened and she went and told her husband Naaman. And then it doesn't say whether the girl told Naaman or the wife told Naaman, but somehow he heard as well. And he had to have heard something that struck his heart that he believed what she said. Naaman was a mighty warrior, and it says the king considered him a great and honorable man. So he was considered hot stuff in that country, wasn't he? And so to listen to a very young slave girl who was a captive and to believe her words enough to go into the king himself and tell the king, this is what she said. There had to have been something in there that they heard. And this proves that she heard God and had the anointing to speak this message. You understand? And we know that she heard God. Why? Because it worked. A lot of times people will say, oh, God said, blah, 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 and it doesn't ever work. We know they did not hear God. But she heard God. That's why it worked, because she heard it, and she was obedient. <laughs> Naaman traveled all the way from Syria to Samaria because he believed. And I looked it up, and if you're driving today, it would be about 404 miles. Now, remember, they didn't have cars back then. The best they probably would have had would have been chariots driven by horses. So just think about this, 404 miles. Okay, and things I read said that if you're driving today, depends upon which way you went, it would be anywhere from seven hours in a car to 13 hours, depending on how you went because of the way the terrain was. So can you imagine? This was not an all-day trip for him. This took a long time, okay? So this is just things that is showing that he believed what this young girl heard, and he obeyed the prophet's instructions, and he was healed because he went and he showed, hey, I believe God's going to heal me because of what she said. Something was transpired in there that he knew in his heart to go do this, okay? But I want to ask you, how did this healing start? How did the healing start? this young girl must have prayed for her master. She must have sought God on his behalf for his healing. 
And what struck me that I thought about this for a couple of days, I just meditated, I just couldn't get over it, the difference between our culture and her heart. Who is this girl? I mean, it just gives me chills now just thinking about it. Who is this girl? When this band of raiders came, she was probably terrified. Wouldn't you be? Quite possibly in the fight, some of her family or friends were killed. This was a raid, okay? That means they weren't expecting the fight. It was a raid. So it was a surprise attack. It was scary. And now she's a captive, a captive. She was stolen away from her family, from her friends, from her homeland, her familiar culture, even her religion, her language, all of her hopes and dreams for her future were now gone. Her life that she would think she would get married and have children because that was extremely important in the day. Everything that she'd ever known was taken from her. That since she was brought to a strange land, that if her masters would allow her to get married, it would be to a strange culture. Do you see what I'm saying? And it would be, um, if she had a family, they would worship a strange god in that Syrian culture. They didn't worship Yahweh. So just think about all these things that happened in her life. These people that uh, would worship the strange god, it was an idol. You know, It's not the living God that we worship. It's an idol, okay? And then she, not knowing what would become of her. Can you think about it? She's young. She's young. She has her whole life in front of her. She doesn't know what would become of her. But what she did know is that she would never see her loved ones ever again. She would never be in her homeland again. She would never get to worship Yahweh with others of like precious faith. She would essentially be a slave all the rest of her life at the mercy in the hands of these godless strangers. But when she heard that her master Naaman had leprosy, she prayed and she sought diligently for him and for his healing. Like I said, how did we know that? Because she heard God's plan. And she had the faith, hearing God, and doing what he said to speak out what she heard. So who is this girl that has suffered all these things and yet she had compassion when she knew her master had leprosy, a skin disease that eventually it eats your whole, all your fingers, your, your parts of your face, everything. It's a type in the, in the scriptures, it's a type of sin and it just gets worse and worse. There was no cure, but she had compassion and she sought God on his behalf. And as I began to reflect on this, I wondered if most of us today in the church, in that same situation, what would we have done? What would we have thought? Would we have said, my master got leprosy, good, serves him right. He stole me. These godless people, they don't worship the true God. Serves him right to get leprosy. Or would she have said, God, I hope he dies. If he dies, they'll probably let me go, and I could go back. I could find my homeland. Have you ever heard people talk about that, think that way, people we know? I just, I just, it just really stirred me a lot <laughs> when I was seeing all this in the scriptures. I'm thinking, oh, God, look how we are, and look how she is, her heart 
She probably thought this godless nation should never have tangled with us or stolen my life away from me. But instead, this young captive girl who was stolen away from everything she knew had compassion and she prayed for him and she showed him great honor and she showed God honor and submission. And I kept thinking, who is this girl? Her attitude is amazing, isn't it? When you think about it, it's amazing. Naaman may, you know, he was a commander. He may have been one that commanded this raiding party or commanded them to go do it. Or he could have bought her from someone else who stole her from her homeland. Because it says that she was a gift for his wife. So we don't know who actually stole her and gave her as a gift, but it very well could have been Naaman. But either way, she didn't hold a grudge or say, God, I'm not going to pray for him when she felt the unction. She didn't say, God, I'm not going to tell them you want to heal him. I'm not going to tell them Elisha the prophet has walked in miracles and healing and that he could get healed if he goes. She didn't do that, did she? She didn't do that. Instead, she spoke. She didn't try to get out of being a maidservant, a slave. She didn't try to get out of being a captive. But she trusted her God and she served Naaman and his wife with compassion and love. And I was thinking about, you know, her heart, even though it's in the New Testament, I think it's Paul where he says, you know, when you come into the kingdom, when you come into the kingdom of Jesus Christ, when you receive him, and he says, if you're a slave, don't try to get out of it. Now, if they offer it, he says, take it, be, be free. You know, and I was thinking, look how she has this heart. She didn't have the New Testament, but she apparently had a relationship with her God, and she took on his heart characteristics. So her humble attitude was obvious to Naaman's wife, and I believe was obvious to Naaman himself. And so they listened when this young, captive girl spoke. And it just struck me so hard, the difference between her culture and ours and her heart attitude. Did you know she didn't have the Holy Scriptures to read? She didn't have a Bible like we have. Now she's in a captive country. She didn't have the Holy Ghost She didn't speak in tongues, building up herself on her most holy faith, edifying herself. She didn't have that. She didn't have a preacher to listen to, to explain the gospel. She didn't have that. She didn't have YouTube where she could get online and and watch teachings. She didn't have books, good Christian books that could help her. She didn't have a church to attend or a bunch of friends she could meet in a prayer meeting to help her. Who is this girl? Who is this girl? This young captive girl. I mean, I am just bowled away by her. Who is she? Who is she? Who is she? She still knew how to walk according to God's heart. And she only wanted to do her owners good. They owned her, remember? She only wanted to do her owners good. No wonder 
she had a miracle. She didn't think or speak evil of her owners, her rulers, but it seemed as I kept thinking in our country, we usually speak evil of our leaders, our parents, sometimes our grandparents, our president, our other government leaders, our bosses on our job. And I was thinking of several churches I've been in. They speak evil of their pastor. And most of them, they vote for them to come. They listen to him preach. They're supposedly praying a week or two. They have cottage prayer meetings. This is the one God sent us. We know that we know it. We go and ask him. He prays, okay, yeah, I'll come. Within a year, I've heard it. Lots of them, they're complaining. They're speaking evil of him. They're murmuring and complaining. And yet, they said, God sent us this man of God. A little bit later, there's the evil. The thinking, the evil speaking. And yet the Bible says in Titus 3, 1 and 2, remind the believers to submit to the government and its officials. The New King James calls to submit to rulers and authorities. They, the believers, should be obedient. Obedient to God, okay? Obedient, always ready to do what is good. To speak evil of no one. Whoop. Uh oh. To speak evil of no one? What if they're evil people? We know some evil people, don't we? But he says, speak evil of no one. So there's something in the power of our words when we speak evil. You can see the evil, you can call out to God on it. You can pray, God open their eyes. You can do a lot of things with intercession, especially when we have tongues, okay? And we have the word of God. But to speak evil of someone, is that not considered a curse when we speak evil of people? And look in our nation. I mean, our, you know, when you drive home sometimes and you hear all these famous people that are talk radio people and they're, they're just bashing our government constantly. Did I vote for some of these people? No, I did not. But God tells me I'm not to speak evil of no one, no one. I'm supposed to speak, God, please speak to them. You know, words of life, to open their ears, open their hearts. So it says to speak evil of no one, and they, the believers, must avoid quarreling. Whoa, are we quarrelers in America? Pretty much, pretty much in our nature, isn't it? Instead, they should be gentle, peaceable, and show true humility to everyone. Not just your friends, to everyone. Is this a hard word? It's hard to walk this out, isn't it? 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4 says... I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them. Intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. How many of us give thanks for our boss, our leaders, our president, our governor, Our pastor, yes. How many give thanks for our vice president, for our policeman that pulled us over because we were speeding? I mean, come on. We're Americans. This is a hard scripture for us to walk out. But this is the word of the Lord. We want to take everything God says, even the bitter with the sweet. Okay? So... I'm start that again. I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them. 
Intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings, and we have presidents, and all who are in authority. That could be teachers, our family members that are over us, okay? So we are to pray for all who are in authority so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. That girl seemed awful dignified, didn't she? I mean, that took a lot of dignity to walk this out. Anyway, he goes on and says, This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. So in case you wanted to write those scriptures down, that was 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4. And the other one I'd given was Titus 3, 1 through 2. So as we pray for them, intercede on their behalf, because obviously... If they're not very good leaders, what does that mean? They don't know God, at least not very well, do they? So that's why we're to pray and intercede on their behalf, okay? Makes sense, doesn't it? So we're supposed to pray with compassion and thankfulness that our leaders will hear God and do everything he is directing them to do. Whether they know that they're hearing God or they don't know that they're hearing God. That's part of our job, that they will be moved by his spirit with truth and accuracy, that our leaders would be open to God's will and God's plan because we're God's people. We are God's people, and we are praying for God to have entrance into our government, into our leaders' lives, and into the decisions that they make. And this is a little side note right now. You know, I'm thinking you've all heard what people are saying about our president now, his mental state. And I'm thinking when I started hearing all that, as soon as he took office, I thought, my God. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people, even Christians, are saying things about him mentally, physically. What does that do in the air? Do you think he has thousands of demons jumping on him and making him worse? I've heard Christians say bad things, and I know some of you have read it on your social media, and I'm thinking, what would happen if even half of the Christians that are moaning and complaining and saying horrible things would get before God and say, God, you know I didn't vote for him, but God, I'm asking that he, somebody would come in his path that knows the true and living God, not religious crap that's been taught that is all error, but someone who really knows you, God, someone that could speak to him, that could speak to the vice president, that could speak to some of these leaders. God, we're praying for his heart and her heart to be open, that they would come to acknowledge you. God, you could come to them in a dream and speak to them, and they would know that you are real. You're a real God, not just a, a like name and worshiped idols. You're not an idol. They would meet the real, true, and living God. What if even a thousand Christians in the United States would pray that? Do you think it would make a little difference? What if we did? <laughs> I know we do once in a while hit and miss, but you know, you're just thinking about this, thanking him that we live in a country that we can vote for presidents. Not everybody gets to, do they? We can thank God for that office and praying, God, we we want the best person in there. God, we would like to live peaceable 
lives. We would like to live the way you told us to, quiet lives marked by gentleness, humility, and peaceful. And why did he say? Not only is it please God our Savior, it's good and it pleases God our Savior. He wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. A lot of decisions that's being made, not only in our country, your country, some countries that are watching, the decisions aren't good. They're not understanding truth. They do not know the truth, Jesus Christ. They may have had some religion, but they do not know the truth. So if you only know error, what kind of decisions are you going to make? Has the people of God fallen down on the job? Of course we have. So because this captive young girl was obedient, look what happened after Naaman was healed. Verse 14. So Naaman went down to the Jordan River and he dipped himself seven times as the man of God instructed him. So apparently he realized, I need to do this according to the pattern. Because first I thought it would be better to do my own way, but I better do what the man of God said, the pattern. So he did as the man of God instructed him, and his skin became as healthy as the skin of a young child, and he was healed. Then Naaman and his entire party went back to find the man of God. When I looked that up, that's about 32 miles from Samaria to the Jordan River. When he saw he was healed, he went back again. That would be another about 32 miles to tell and thank the man of God. So think of this, this long trip. It doesn't say how long it took, but I'm sure it was pretty arduous. You know, that's kind of desert land, as far as I can tell. So after he saw he was healed, it says, then Naaman and his entire party, all of his officers, all of his people that were with him, that he had to have either wagons or chariots. I mean, unless he had a lot of men that carried all that gold and silver, that's a lot of weight. They had to have water, and you think about it. So he went back to find the man of God. They stood before him, and Naaman said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. And you remember what Elisha said to um, his king when he was really upset and tearing his clothes. He said, um, where is this where he said that? Anyway, he was saying something like, um, you know, bring him to me, you know. And he's going to know there's a real prophet in Israel. So it looks like Naaman understood that, doesn't it? <laughs> now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. As I said, Naaman was an idol worshiper. And yet he experienced the living God because of this young, captive girl. This girl, this unknown, captive girl who sought God on Naaman's behalf. And she was obedient to speak what she heard. So then I was thinking, okay... How do we tie this also into today? We used to be captives of Satan, didn't we? Some areas of our life we still are, and Satan is our enemy. But now because of Jesus and his blood that he shed and that very high price he paid to redeem us, 
we now have been captured by the heart of God, haven't we? We used to be captive to Satan and the demonic realm, to a lot of sin, destruction, disease. But Jesus paid a high price. He set us free from sin and from the hand of our enemy. And now, I love that, we've been captured by the heart of God. We've captured his heart as well, though, haven't we? He's crazy about us. We now live in a new kingdom, a different kingdom. We've been translocated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. We've become children of God and joint heirs with Christ. Colossians 1, 9 through 14 says, So we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord, and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while, you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. We also pray that you will be strengthened with all his glorious power so you will have all the endurance and patience you need. May you be filled with joy, always thanking the Father. He has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people who live in the light. For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son who purchased our freedom with his blood and forgave our sins. That's why we celebrate Resurrection Day. We now have a totally new culture with a totally new language. We're to renew our minds so we have a totally new mindset. We're trying to bring heaven's culture into earth, into our culture, aren't we? We no longer, here in this church, we know God. So we no longer blaspheme or speak evil of God's nature, his character, his name, because we now know him. And we're knowing him better all the time, aren't we? We know that he's good, and he only does good. And we love him. We love him a lot. We may not speak bad about God anymore, but what about our attitudes toward people? Do we think or speak bad against people, especially our rulers? We need to hear on how to show people who the true God is. Remember the scripture I read. He said that he wants all people to understand and know the truth. So we need to show people who the true God is, who we have met. You know, not the mean, harsh God, but the one who has love and compassion and wants to change our lives, our insides, our nation, the nations of the world, everywhere that we go and connect with people, whether it's on the job where we live, on social media, however. We want to show who the real God is, the true God. Some of it might be like this girl, through prayers, through healing, or even humbly serving our rulers. And that's going to be hard, isn't it? What if um, someone comes and takes over our country? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? That's a scary thought, isn't it? What are we going to do?
What if God tells us, get on your face and pray for these people? They, if somebody takes us over, and I'm not saying they will, I'm just saying, what if? Chances are they will be godless strangers with a different culture, a different language, a different God. What are we going to do? Maybe you think you're the lowest of the low, like this young girl. Maybe you think, I'm so low, I, I don't have no voice. I have absolutely no voice. But what did we see? How God can still use you, even if you're a young slave girl. God can still use you if you keep your heart open, if you keep that relationship with him, if you pray and bless people and thank God for people and don't speak evil of anyone. In this church, we know we've been preparing ourselves. We've been making ourselves ready. We've been growing up to be the bride. We may be betrothed in a sense, but we've not, in a way, become the bride yet. We're still young. Like I've said before, Jesus doesn't, isn't a pedophile. He's not going to marry a young girl. He wants a mature bride that is like him. Do you understand what I'm saying? He wants us to grow up and mature. And that's what we're doing. We're growing and we're maturing. We're receiving his wooing. We're receiving his love. But we haven't totally become one with him yet. We're not ready. Okay? But we're preparing ourselves. How many has changed in the last 10 years? <laughs> Quite a bit, haven't we? We've changed a lot. We're growing up to be the bride without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. Ephesians 5, I'm starting at 23. He says, Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to set her apart, to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing water of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious, radiant church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. Now that sounds to me like a captive slave girl who was changed into a radiant bride. Doesn't it? We who once were captives we're being changed into the image of Jesus Christ, to be worthy of him, to become a radiant bride. And I want Jesus to take a look at us and catch his breath and marvel. <gasps> Who is this girl? Who is this girl? Isn't that exciting that he would look at us and say, who is this girl? Who is this girl? He's waiting on us, isn't he? He's waiting on us to grow up and become that radiant bride without spot, wrinkle, or blemish, holy, set apart for his use only, without any fault. Can you conceive it yet? My Bible tells me that these scriptures in the Old Testament are for our example. We're to learn by them. And if this 
very young, captive slave girl could portray the heart of the father. Can't we? We who have the scriptures, we who have preachers, we who have the Holy Spirit who actually wrote this Bible, he gave us praying in tongues so we can build ourselves up on our most holy faith, keeping ourselves in the love of God. That's a powerful gift he gave us. We have a church that we can come and gather. We have people that we know care for us and helps us pray when we need it. Has anybody ever had somebody come to you and say, I feel like, Oh, God, I don't want to say this, but I feel like God's telling me to tell you, you have this problem. Does anybody? I've had that happen to me. Am I the only one? Oh, come on. I'm the only sinner in the room. I've opened my Bible and read, oh, God, I'm sorry. Oh, God, cleanse me of this unrighteousness. Please, God, take this out of me. I've been singing songs, and I hear God say things. So if this young girl, who probably was all by herself in the sense of other believers with her in a strange land, a strange tongue, in the midst of idolatry worship, a slave for the rest of her life, can do this. Do we have any excuse? Nah. Nah. So we have to lay aside our Americanisms that our country was founded on rebellion. Yes, they came first because they wanted religious freedom. I'm not saying that's wrong. But when you watch all the way down through history, we have a lot of rebellion, and a lot of people in other countries, that's one of the things they say is, we think, you know, we're all it, and we know everything, and we walk with confidence, and fake it till you make it, till you make it. yeah. And that's in the church. That's what's really disgusting. I mean, if it's out there in the world, you know, so what? Unbelievers are going to be unbelievers. But in the church, it's my prayer that we come up another notch and we allow God to deal with our heart and we begin to love our leaders. And real love isn't just, ooh, I, do, oh, God, I just love them. No, it's you lay your life down, whether it's a minute, a week, or you, all of a sudden you think or you hear somebody especially on talk radio or something, and you hear them slamming terrible things, and you just say, oh, God, no. God, convict those people. God, I pray health. I pray healing of the mind. I pray a renewing. I pray, God, your man or woman is in the right spot. God, you move. We want you to be the Lord of our nation. We want what you're saying, your kingdom come right here, right now, on earth, exactly as it is in heaven. Those kind of prayers. It don't have to, it doesn't have to be an hour long, but it needs to be heartfelt. It needs to be when you're unctioned that you give voice to what he's putting you to declare and to say. Some people, their lives are giving more to set times of intercession and prayer. Others, we pray on the fly. It's just times that, okay, once a week, you're really praying good. The rest of the time, you're like, oh, God, help me. Oh, God, what about this? What do you say, God? Oh, God. You know, you're not really getting down and, and birthing something. You see what I'm saying? But we all have a mouth that we can speak blessing. And he says in the New Testament somewhere, you know, that we shouldn't have Blessing and cursing come out of the same mouth. We're not to have sweet water and bitter water coming out of the same spout. That, that 
that doesn't even make sense. So that's what I would adjure you, that we're wanting to grow up and become like Jesus. You know, it says when he was reviled, he didn't revile back. He didn't complain. And I mean, look at what all he lived through. He didn't. He trusted himself in the hands who judged righteously, which is the Father. He did what he was supposed to do, and he became a sacrificial lamb. And there was people that saw him, that even that Roman centurion, you know, when he saw how he died, he didn't curse and say, you know, God's going to get you for this. He said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Would that Roman citron say, centurion say, this must be the Son of God. He must be who he said he was. And even Pilate put that sign. He said, he's the king of the Jews. And they said, no, say he says he's the king of the Jews. He said, I wrote what I wrote. He's the king of the Jews. He saw something in his demeanor. He saw something. There may be times God tells you to do something, run away and hide. I don't know. We don't know. You know, Paul had leaders after him, and there was a time he was put down in a basket. I mean, there's things that God may have you do, but that you don't always just lay there and say, well, beat me, kill me, whatever. No, that's not what I'm saying. But she went to God to pray for him with compassion and with love, laying her life down. She trusted in her God, and her God spoke to her, and she was obedient. That's what I'm saying. There will be things that God may tell you to do, and you must do them because we're to obey God instead of man. So, yes, God, we want When Jesus looks at us, we want to catch his breath. That he says, who is this girl? That when he looks at us, he'll say, it's been worth it. What I lived through, what I gave up, it's worth it to get a bride that looks like my father. You got the mic? Mm. I'm just interesting <clears throat> when we compare cultures, their culture with ours, it would be interesting to drop a 21st century American back into their culture. You'd almost feel like you were in an alien world mm-hmm. because of the honor system that they had yes. that we don't have anymore. Yes. You know? Um, the slave girl honoring Naaman mm-hmm. and wanting him healed, and yet she was taken in a raid, and yet we can't even get children to honor their own parents in our in our country. I mean, you see how far we've Cares fallen, <laughs> and where we have to get back to in the yes. church. But as Kathy shared this message with me, or the part about the slave girl, I know a couple of days ago, and I was thinking about it in the wee hours of the night. <laughs> you know, trying to get to sleep. And I just thought, you know, how we should have the same heart in in a different way, though. This is the way I looked at it was that, see, to me, Jesus has leprosy in the in the earth, you know, his church, his body, because leprosy represented sin in their day. It was they they, that's what it it represented. And, uh, you know, we're telling we should be telling people, you know, to but led by the Holy Spirit, mm-hmm. you know, to go to the Father for their healing. But that's not what's being done. Right. Right. You know, we're telling them to go to church. We're telling them formulas. Mm-hmm. We're telling them different things. Mm-hmm. And I thought there was a, a, another side to this as well is that, you know, the slave girl would represent the Holy Spirit and, you know, would be telling Naaman the church who has leprosy how to get healed and where to go to get healed. Mm -hmm. And how many people like have been told to come here Mm -hmm. and it's just like Naaman. Well, 
They should tell me something. They should tell me to go to Benny Hinn. They should tell me to go to somebody, you know, some great guy. And aren't the churches in, you know, Omaha or, or Kansas City or, you know, Des Moines, aren't they greater than that church? Or the other side of Bedford. Yeah, or the other side of Bedford or, you know, shouldn't, aren't they better than that church there in Bedford? And see, they won't come. And I thought it was interesting because he had to dip seven times. Yeah. That's a time reference that it didn't happen instantaneously. So it's if, when God does give you that direction, mm -hmm. it's going to take some time mm -hmm. before you get healed. And I think how many people have told me they've been called to this church, but they won't come here, just like Naaman. They've got the same excuses that Naaman has, mm -hmm. and they'd rather just go up in the prayer line and get yeah. healed. And that represents you know, the other rivers that Naaman was naming off. Mm -hmm. And it, it just shows you the direction that God always wants to take people a different way, and we do it our own way. Yep. You know, I mean, this is a great story, you know, to find, to see how the, the length, mm -hmm. and, you know, we talked last week about being comfortable. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't comfortable for him to go 404 miles, mm -hmm. you know, and then, and then go back 30, 30 uh, yeah, another 60, what, 64 miles going back and then going back again. Mm -hmm. But see, that's what he did. Mm -hmm. And that's why he received what he received. Mm -hmm. And so many times people want it. A comfortable mm -hmm. way, mm -hmm. and that's what he did. That's yeah. what he said. I want to do my own rivers. You have to you know, I want you to say some great thing over me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I won't have to travel. I want you to say some great thing after me. That's and what that's, I thought was funny too you know, when I read it, where he said, "I just thought he'd wave his hand over the leprosy." Yeah. I thought, and, "Where and, did they and, get yeah, that?" Yeah, you I'm sitting there. I'm time. thinking, Ooh. yeah. When you read that, I'm thinking, "Boy, there, Not there's your church change. right there. Nothing's changed, has it? There's nothing <laughs> new under the sun because that's exactly what they want." And yet God has this big elaborate process that Naaman has to go through to get it. Yeah. And most people, thank God Naaman did what he did, yes. but that's also a story. You, you read it, uh, many stories in there where God told people yes. to do things and they didn't God. do them, yeah. and they didn't get what they were right. called or what was right. destined for them to have. Right. Right. And here was an, a successful example. And I just think of the people in the past that have been called into this church mm -hmm that they said were, they were called. I'm not, I'm not saying they were called. They said they were right. called here. But it was too far to come, or it was too much trouble, too or it's too long, or too loud. It seemed or, too long. Yeah, whatever it was, yeah. and they missed. Or my family. They missed their skin being changed into a yes. young child. You can you see know? it. I mean, that's interesting, too, because usually a, a young child, you know, when we talk about skin, a young child has not had the hardness of right. sin to deal with in their life. And I think that's what that's representative yes, of. Because it says Be again, yeah, it, yeah, the skin of a young child. Yeah. You know, they're innocent, they're carefree. And it's sad that so many people have been hardened and, and you know, mm -hmm. for lack of a better term, their whole outlook on life and the way they live is totally perverted yeah. because of their sin. Imagine that all being taken away, you know. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the years being restored, as the scripture says, yeah. that the canker worm is eaten. Yeah. And, and it's like you're a whole new person. Right. You know, because that's what's supposed to happen. Yes, it is. And yes. it hasn't happened because all because we won't follow what God is saying. Mm -hmm. Now that I, I <laughs> no, well, when you were talking about the dipping seven times, you know, seven represents yes. divine and perfection yes. means his way. It means his way, you know. And so I had a couple just a couple different things that I jotted down um, where the slave girl, you know, she might have been a slave, but she, she was, was free. free. Yeah. She was free, just like I don't know why this makes me cry, but like Paul and Silas, yeah. they might have been in prison, but they weren't in prison. Paul spent the last years of his life. He was in prison, but he was free. Yes. See, and I just I thought I want to make that point. And um, um, something else popped up too. Um, in my medical studies, the largest organ of the body is your skin. Yeah. I thought that was yeah. interesting. So I was yeah. thinking about that with leprosy and stuff it and lies. sin. Yeah. And um, I also thought about when you were talking, um. And I never say it right, but it's the thing that God told you about. It's not enough to be a John, John the, Baptist. the Baptist. Can you say prophet. that? It's not enough to be the John the, a John the Baptist that prophesies the way of the Lord. 
you have to become like Jesus and love the people enough to die for them. Right, right. And that always touches me so much. And I'm thinking about, you know, like we, we've come out of the world, right? And now we're trying to come out of Babylon. And I remember the Lord showing me, I had this vision of us in a cave and it felt like, okay, this was Babylon, this dark cave and we could see the light. And it wasn't just for us to run out of it, but that we were running back and forth. Grabbing people. Grabbing people. And the thing is, is that sometimes when we, I think that sometimes we can get that idea of, you know, we're coming out of Babylon, or we're coming out of the world, and it's like, leave them just to hell and let them die, you know, that kind of thing. You know, forget about them. But how is God's new system going to be here? It's because we are changing. And like, right. you talk about revolutionary. What does that mean when they see like in a car engine, revolution? It means turning it around. And so how, how is that going to come? Mm -hmm. It's not going to be just like, okay, we have, we're coming out of Babylon and now we're in God's system and forget everybody else. We're changing and making a revolution yes. and turning it for God. Yes. Because this is his, this earth is his. Yes. And it's like, sometimes like we can, we got to be careful we don't go in that old mindset of, well, the earth's just going to blow up and then we're going to live on this new thing. It's like, this belongs to him. And we are taking captive these things that have been stolen and that are his. And so it's like, we might live in this world, but we are not, we're free yeah. if we want to be. Right. You know? yeah. That's good. I Very think that, good. that was all the things I had. Oh, and then I also thought about, as you were talking, that song, I've been waiting for a girl like you. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I thought of that two or three nights ago. I was thinking, that's, that's something God said to me years ago, years, decades ago, wasn't it? And I hadn't heard that song in years, years. And I, I woke up. And, and I heard it being sung in my head, and then we, we were on our way to Colorado, and then I, I woke up on the driving, he was driving, and it was on the radio, and I thought, are you saying something to me, God, what is it? And then we went and bought groceries and stuff, we went to, it used to be called Gibson's, and we went in and we're buying supplies, that song came on the radio again, and then I went, that was when I ministered to this new age woman <laughs> up in Telluride. And, um, and then that night, I heard it again. And it just, like all night long, it just kept singing, I've been waiting for a girl like you. I've been waiting for a girl like you to come into my life. And this is what he, he that's not just me, he's saying this to all of us because he wants us to get this, he, like I've said before, it's not that we're anything special, but we've said yes as far as we can right now. We're saying, yes, God, I choose you again. Yes, yes, I want to go the whole way, God. I want to. And so he's waiting. He's been waiting. The Father has been waiting centuries and centuries and centuries. And Jesus has been waiting a couple thousand years at least you know, for a bride, you know, someone that would make him feel alive. <sighs> and he's, he's waiting for us, like I said, where he would look at us and catch his breath and say, who is this girl? I mean, I have just been amazed. I've just read this again and again. It just, I just, it's really spoke to me a lot. And so... <clears throat> I wanted to speak to you guys too. Anyone else have anything? Oh, Mordecai does good. That was very nice. It really uh, pointed out how sinful I've been in regards to how I look at more especially leaders. Uh, but my focus is on the, I think what you've taught today breaks the world system of do for me something, I do for you something, scratch my back, I, I scratch your yes. back. Because when you read this girl, after uh, Naaman was healed, there's no other telling us that, you know, now he came and appreciated the girl. Right. He instead right. took the 
gifts and everything to the king, yeah. uh, to the man of God. Uh, so the world system is, you do for me something, I do for you something. But what is satisfying this girl is doing the God's will. Yeah. That's only what she wants. And they're, telling us, they're not telling us that, you know, after when he came back, then he told this girl, thank you so much for what you did. He yeah. instead took appreciation to the man of God. Yeah. And I think that was nice. Yeah, it doesn't say anything more about her. Like you said, whether he thanked her or, or said, here, I'm setting you free or here's some money. I never thought of that. That's really good, Mordecai. Yeah. Yeah. Go wash the floor. Go wash the floor. <laughs> I've been healed. Now get to work. <laughs> amazing. It's amazing. Anyone else? really spoke to me too in a lot of ways but also she was it doesn't say anything about it but she didn't get bitter because he didn't thank her or set her free she did it without expectation yeah. and that's the thing is that whether we see the change or not mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that we aren't obedient or don't right. appreciate that God heard us yeah. because or because we were obedient mm -hmm. we may not even see the result right and don't not to get better bitter because you didn't get what was expected. Yeah. You know, yeah. she did it out of selflessness and because it was what God told her to do. Right. So you don't see her, you know, sitting in the background saying, well, that I was the one that was the one that gave the word of God. I was the one that, mm -hmm. you know, delivered the, yeah. the words of deliverance yeah. and I'm not being acknowledged. And that's very strong in the church yes. and in the United States. But yeah. she didn't take any credit for herself at all that you see. So yeah. I just, I just, honestly, because we are going to be used like this and have been used like this. And what happens when God uses us and it's a pure work and then we turn around and negate it with the words of our mouth and our attitude? Mm. Yeah. I mean, we can go half the way, mm -hmm. and then we may not see result in, in things that have happened in our job or our family or, or our life because we negated it with our word and our attitude. Mm -hmm. We went half the way, and then when it didn't turn out the way we wanted it mm -hmm. to, we, we turned it totally around because yeah. of our attitude and our word. what you said her reward wasn't her getting free mm -hmm. like it seems to me that her reward was knowing God mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. You got something? Good. Well, I just keep thinking that she had the attitude that Jesus had. She said, um, Father, forgive them for they know not yeah. what they do. And I don't know how old she was, but, you know, maybe she was being abused in her own country and stuff. I mean, you don't know what don't she know. was going through. Yeah. You hate to think that where she, when they captured her and everything, that that was better than what she yeah. was going through at home. But yeah. sometimes, yeah. as I read in the Bible and stuff, there's pr some pretty wicked things going on yeah. all the time. So you don't know what she was going through. Anyone else? Okay, Father, teach us. Teach us to know your ways. The way your heart is, God. We thank you what you've been doing, and, and, but we want to ask again. Teach us to know your ways and to walk in your ways. That's our heart desire 
to be a love slave of yours, Lord God, that we mature and become just like you, that the world, the people that are around us will know that there really is a real, true, living God. That you're the same today as you have been through all eternity. Loving so much that you gave your son for us to redeem us out of the hand of the enemy the one who captured our souls and our bodies and has been harsh to us. But you are not a harsh taskmaster, Lord God. You are a good God who only does good, and we just thank you. You could be and do anything you ever wanted because you are God, but you are good all the time. You are love, and your hand is always outstretched toward us, you never put the hand up against us. Don't talk to me. Don't come near me. No, your hands are outstretched. Come unto me, you say. Come unto me and know my heart. Yeah, we want to melt into who you are. Like she had said earlier, the butter, just melting into you, becoming one with you. Seal up all these things, God, that you've been speaking to each one of us individually, God. Seal it up and cause it to bear good fruit to your account, to the glory of your name, Lord. And we thank you for it. Amen.